Can you provide an overview of Harbinger Motors and its mission in the electric vehicle industry? Sure. Um, so here at Harbinger, we're focused on electrifying the medium duty segment. Uh, this is a segment where we think that the opportunities for electrification are, are clear and compelling. The way that these vehicles are used means that they, they fit naturally into electrification. Uh, we don't have to change the way customers operate or the way the vehicles are, are used to make electrification fit. So when we look at this segment, we see, we think the best fit for electrification. And yet when we look very broadly at automotive, what we see is that medium duty is the part of the market where there's really not much happening. Uh, there's very little activity here in electrification, but there's also very little activity here uh, in product development in general. Most medium duty products on the road are decades old. And so, you know, we saw that, that real contrast between a market that made perfect sense and a place where no one else seemed interested in making a real effort and thought this is a place where we can make a real difference. So this focus on, uh, on medium duty electric vehicles, um, and can you really, can you go into more detail on uh, uh, why you decided to specialize on this segment? So if we, if we think about the whole automotive market to start, uh, it runs from uh, what the, the DOT would call class one to class eight. So we've got passenger cars all the way up to long haul trucks. At the bottom end of the market, at the lightweight vehicles, class one and class two, you've got vehicles that are unibody construction. They are designed uh, overwhelmingly for private ownership and, and kind of personal use and they're optimized very heavily on cost. At the very top end of the market, you have vehicles that are really never used for, for personal use. No one's driving a Class A truck to work, I hope. Uh, these are vehicles that are entirely commercial in nature, and they're massively optimized for durability. So you have sort of obvious endpoints in the market. And then in the middle, you have a market where people are just sort of like, eh, let's, let's just stick whatever technology we have into that market and see how it goes. So you end up with vehicles in medium duty that tend to be too heavy and too expensive because people have reused technology from class eight or they're not durable enough because people are trying to reuse technology from class one and class two. But you just end up with a lot of vehicles today that, that don't really meet the customer's needs or that are very, very old. So this segment is, um, about three to 400,000 vehicles per year in the US. And by automotive standards, that's a really small market. Um, this market, the medium duty chassis market, it's worth about $20 billion a year. The pass car market in the US is, um, I think about 10 million vehicles a year. So it's dramatically larger. And the result is that when people look at this market, especially from the viewpoint of a big OEM, they look at it and they say, well, that market is really demanding. You know, it has these high durability requirements. It has very high sensitivity to weight. Uh, it's, you know, you can spend more money than you spend in passenger cars, but people aren't willing to pay what they pay for a class eight truck. So it's hard to make a product that fits this market's requirements unless you're willing to make it from scratch. And if you're someone like Ford and you're making, you know, three to 4 million vehicles a year, you look at this market and say, ah, it's, you know, do we really want to make a new platform for 400,000 vehicles a year? And so you start to understand that there's there's just this wasteland here where big OEMs don't find it compelling. And again, that's why we see this really compelling niche. It does seem like a growing uh, market as well with all the delivery vans and, and, and growth in the uh, market for personal RVs, uh, that sort of thing. So the chassis that undergrids all of that is uh, something that seems like a, a natural market for an EV, especially the delivery vans where it's uh, people going, uh, you could charge overnight while you're, and then load up and then get out in the morning and drive all day and then uh, get back and charge up again while you're loading. So it seems like a real natural fit for an EV application. Right, you look at a UPS truck and say, well, that vehicle's used 10 hours a day, 
it parks all night and isn't used for anything. It parks in the same place every night. That place that it parks is an industrial depot, so they tend to have decent power on site already. Um, the vehicle's got a 20-year life, so you've got huge opportunities to save a lot of money with an EV. You sort of put all that together, and you're like, well, this makes – like this makes even more sense than passenger cars. Right. Why aren't all these vehicles EVs? And the buyers are uh, extremely conscious of the of the operating costs of their right. of their fleet, and that's where the EV product just really shines. Yeah, it seemed. I agree. It does seem like a really great. Uh, market, but how does uh, Harbinger differentiate themselves? Uh, you mentioned that you came from XOS, and uh, so there's there are other competitors that are, I think, trying to get into this market. Um, how how is Harbinger Motors differentiating themselves um, with the competition? So this is this is definitely a market where people have been trying for a while. We're by no means a first mover. But you know, we can see already in the rearview mirror that the highway is, is littered with companies that haven't really accomplished much. And really, that comes down to appetite for uh, investment in technology. When we look at this segment, overwhelmingly what people have tried to do in medium duty is they say, well, there's a, there's a diesel truck. Let's just shoehorn some batteries into that. That would be a great product. And you can kind of understand why, you know, maybe that made sense to people in 2005. I'm always shocked that that still is something people think is going to work out, you know, in 2024. Um, if we look back to the, the earliest EVs, they were things like the Volt, um, the Coda vehicle, the Think vehicle. You know, the, the attempts at electrification from 1995 to 2010 were very much in the vein of take a vehicle, an ICE vehicle, and stuff an electric system into it. And no one really wants that product. Right. I, I always say when you sit in a, 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 a volt, you get to you know, bump your leg against the transmission tunnel. Now, there's no transmission in that vehicle. There's no prop shaft. There's no shifter. But we've got a transmission tunnel there. And that you know, terrible ergonomic compromise is the result of saying, well, we had a platform and there's a transmission tunnel. So it's still there. It wasn't until Tesla came along with the Model S and showed people that if you're really willing to make an effort, if you're willing to throw everything away and start from scratch with a clean slate, the electric vehicle that you could build is not only competitive, it's a dramatically better product than a gas or diesel vehicle. Now, the passenger car industry had opportunities to learn that in 2010. I think that's been a very tough lesson for the big legacy OEMs to learn. Tesla has been, been teaching them that lesson like over and over again for the last 10 years, but most of them have figured it out right now. You can, you can go and get in a, an ID4 or an F-150 Lightning, and it's a pretty good product, right? People buy those. They're, they're products that stand on their own. When you look at medium duty, no one's learned that lesson yet. So when you look at uh, Freightliner MT-50E, for example, which is a competitive product of, to us, you're literally looking at a Freightliner MT-55 diesel engine, and they took the diesel engine out and they put in battery packs from Proterra and a drivetrain from Dana and, you know, aux systems from everyone else. And you sort of have the proverbial, you know, 10 pounds in a five pound bag. And that's the result of that compromise. So what Harbinger has done differently is we started from scratch. Here at Harbinger, we own the complete IP on the entire vehicle. So when you look at a Harbinger chassis, you're seeing a Harbinger frame, a Harbinger suspension system, Harbinger axles, Harbinger steering, Harbinger brakes. We're seeing a Harbinger battery system developed completely in-house with our own modules and our own packs, our own multi-pack architecture. You're seeing a Harbinger drivetrain with an in-house build stator and rotor with a Harbinger transmission. So all of that scope on the vehicle is done here. Both the, the exciting EV stuff like the battery packs but also the more mundane automotive stuff like the suspension system and the axles. Those are all Harbinger IP. And that enables us to build a product that is um, significantly more compelling, right? Because we're competing with vehicles that were designed 40 years ago, which is almost an unfair competition. 
And we also are able to offer something that's dramatically cheaper because we own all of that IP and that capacity. So you know, when we buy an axle, our whole supply chain for the axle is one tier deep. Right? You have Harbinger, you have a company that forges metal. And we pay for that on a basically per kilogram basis. And when we look at someone like Freightliner, you know, Freightliner goes to Dana. Dana goes to another supplier. That supplier goes to another supplier. And you've got this you know, very traditional three to four tier supply chain with massive amounts of margin capture at every step along the way.